This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review and fun times here. Yeah, you can say this is mobile. Look how small this is. This is the Intel NUC 12 Extreme. NUC stands for next unit of computing. So they make everything from little palm top PCs that we have reviewed to the more recently these kind of gaming and content creator powerhouse machines. What's insane is not the fact that it looks almost like the 11th gen Extreme that we reviewed, but the fact that in this eight liter case, you have enough room for a full 12 inch length double wide GPU. There's a 650 watt gold rated power supply inside. So you can put a 3080 in here. In fact, we have an RTX 3080 in here, a GeForce edition of that. Nice. And Intel 12th generation Core i7 and Core i9 desktop, 65 watt CPUs socketed, upgradable, just like a bigger desktop. If this is starting to sound interesting, keep watching because we are going to look at it now. And yes, there's RGB lighting along the sides and the skull up front lights up. You can control the RGB lighting on it if you want. So it might be small, but you're still getting that kind of bling that you might expect from a gaming rig. Cooling on here is really very well done. We have three very large fans along the top here. We have one on the side. And then of course, whatever your GPU is bringing to the table for cooling solution there. And then a rear exhaust area little fan turbine thingy going on to our fan shroud. So when you're thinking, oh, I don't know, this much power in something this small, it is possible. And then you're thinking, so why would I want to get something like this, right? And it's not because it's cheaper, because believe me, it's not. It's because you don't have a lot of room for a tower, one thing. Another thing is actually the quality and the engineering that went into this. I mean, I've reviewed HP Omens, Dell, I've owned Dell XPS, towers and gaming towers and all that sort of thing. And with all of them, I always feel like there are some concessions that were made to price or engineering and design. Why did they put the fan there? Why didn't they put a fan over here? What cheesy motherboard standoffs and look, I'm getting a short because the motherboard's flexing every time I'm plugging something in. So none of that happens here. And I have to say, having done this for decades now that they really did a very good job at the engineering of this. And of course it's unique in an interesting way. So we're going to look at the internals because this is also all about DIY. You can buy this thing just bare bones, which means you get the processor, but no RAM, no SSD, no GPU. And I do suggest if you can sourcing the GPU yourself because you know how hard they are to get and how expensive they are. Or you can get this from Simply Nuck is one of the dealers that sells a lot of these things and they'll put in RAM, SSD, and even sell you a GPU for a painful price if you want to be more tornkey, but this is really about folks who do want to tinker, right? So you open it up, you get inside, and you're like, where's the RAM and where's the SSDs go? Well, there is one SSD bay cleverly hidden on the bottom of the unit under a door for those who don't feel like taking it apart, right? But when you open it up, you'll see what's called the compute element. Now, Intel's been doing this for several generations now. So this is actually a mini motherboard with a socketed LGA 1700 processor, two RAM slots and two M.2 SSD slots. One of them is PCIe Gen 4 in this little compute element that sits in a PCIe slot interesting stuff. The idea is it would make it easier to swap one for another if you're doing upgrades. Personally, I don't feel it depends on whether the socket is changed and you actually have to do that sort of thing. Otherwise, socketed processor, just drop a new one in if it's pin compatible, right? And motherboard compatible. But anyway, first thing to note, when you open this thing up, it's not a ship in a bottle, as Intel likes to say, but it takes some work and some patience, okay? You have to be more of an advanced tinkerer to do this. So first you take off the back cover. There's four Phillips head screws and you pop it off. Not too hard. Then you slide off the side covers. Not too hard. Nothing holding them once you take the back off. And then you see two little pull words marked on the side and you can pop up the fans and for the top, right? And then you see the compute unit. You do not have to take out the compute unit to to actually put in RAM and SSDs. Okay, so don't don't put yourself through that. There's no need. Just remove the little fan shroud that sits in a PCIe slot next to the compute unit. And then you'll see two Phillips head screws on the top of the compute unit. And then boom, it's a hinge door. You can open it up. You can actually swap the CPU if you want, because you have access to doing that. There's a socketed processor right there. You have access to the RAM and the SSD. So in a way, it's so cleverly thought out that it's not as bad as it seems. You just have to be okay with working in tight spaces and all that sort of thing.
So there it is. Besides smallness, the engineering is really well done here and high quality. So I don't look at it and say, why, the, why is the fan over here? It's stupid. Are there problems with it? No, everything is really good and it's nice. And it's very vanilla standard Intel. You get all your updates, BIOSes and stuff through Windows Update. No dealing with wacky drivers and all that sort of thing. Cool. Right. You can put a powerful GPU in here. You can actually really, you got game with this thing. I've been testing this with quite a few AAA current titles. And I was a little worried about the thermals on this and how much throttling we'd see on the CPU. Because let's face it, there isn't that much room for cooling, even if it has the most immense fans and mesh grills everywhere to help with the cooling. And it did quite well. Now, when I'm doing something like Cyberpunk, and there I was playing an ultra ray tracing, at 4K and at 2K resolutions, you can see footage for both. Frame rate's quite good on both and frame times. It was fine. A CPU temperature is typically around 80 centigrade. A GPU, of course, is managed and usually set at a limit, but the GPU has enough air to breathe here and it was quite good. So performance was good on that. So I said, okay, that's nice. And we looked at Valhalla. Again, same story. You just play that right at 4K, not a problem at all. Getting your 60 frames per second a little bit better, which for Valhalla is really, all you need. We're not talking a killer first person shooter here, right? So same story, no problem. So then I looked at Far Cry 6, not because that's a great game, because let's face it, that wasn't the best effort there for Far Cry, but because it's very CPU heavy, oddly CPU heavy as games go today, in fact, and it usually does well on Intel. So I knew that it was gonna hit the CPU harder. And you can see how it did, and it did get the temperatures up into the 90s for that. So toasty, but not unacceptable by today's standards, especially if you're used to laptops where, well, CPUs do typically run much hotter than desktops, but that's okay, especially because most games don't really hit the CPU that hard. When doing things like benchmarking, I can tell you that for 3D mark benchmarks, you can see, because both the CPU and the GPU are running gangbusters and generating a lot of heat, that the CPU did hit like 99. I mean, there's it doesn't mind doing that at all, right? But benchmarks and artificial stuff like that actually raise CPU temperatures a lot more than real world use. The Premiere Pro, it tested it with that, not a problem either. When playing something like Far Cry 6, you can see some throttling back. It'll go up into the 90s and then it'll drop temperature wise and watts, you'll see it's in the 90s for watts and then it'll drop down to around 65 watts for a while and then jump back up, but really didn't affect the frame rates or gameplay, so that was fine. So. As a marvel of engineering and really cooling efficiency, they've done a great job here. But if you're one of those people who is totally allergic to the idea of ever seeing your CPU hit 90 under any circumstances, then it's probably not the unit for you. I mean, there's no room for like water cooling in this chassis. So there's only so much that you can do other than repaste it with some better thermal paste or something. When it comes to noise, of course, it makes noise. It is a gaming PC, but it's surprisingly not that loud nor that obnoxious thanks to the very large diameter fans that tend to make more of a whoosh than a whine or anything annoying or loud. It is quieter than my MSI GE76 Raider gaming laptop with a 3080 mobile inside to be sure. And in terms of heat, the heat rises from the top of the unit. Not that much heat. I wouldn't mind a little bit more in the winter time, but that's where the heat comes out of the top. In terms of connectivity, both um, networking and port wise, so they have improved over the NUC 11 chassis. You have a USB A and a USB C port up front, a UHS full size SD card slot, and well, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And we have Wi-Fi 60, of course, with Intel's flavor and Bluetooth 5.2, plus two Ethernet jacks on the back. And we have six USB-A3 ports on the back, two Thunderbolt 4 ports, an HDMI port that connects to the Intel UHD 770 graphics. Of course, you'll have more ports if you put it in your own GPU. You know, the graphics ports there. So, uh, you know, you're not like suffering here for the smaller chassis. That's excellent connectivity on board. Okay, so that's sounding like awesome, right, isn't it? So the price is the not so awesome part. You're looking at around $1,800 to $2,000, depending on whether you want to go with the Core i7 or a Core i9 processor. And that's pretty much just bare bones. If you go to a place like Simply Knock, where they'll put in some RAM and SSDs and stuff like that, uh, you know, around with the Core i7, around $2,200, and you get your 16 gigs of RAM, a one terabyte Gen 4 M.2 SSD, still no ex GPU, you'll have to throw your own in there. So these are expensive. They're not doing this to be budget-minded in the least. 
I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and hit the notification bell so you know about them.